All right. Welcome, welcome to the pre sales collective <clears throat> webinar for today. Looks like we have, there we go, attendees are starting to join us. Welcome, everybody. All right, if you are here now and you can hear me, I would love to know in the chat, uh, one, where you're dialing in from. It's one of my favorite parts about these webinars. And two, if this is your first pre-sales collective webinar or if you've been here before, just let us know in the chat. Austin, Texas, welcome. Atlanta, India, Dubai, love it. Repeat visitors on, on the global audience. Texas, Oklahoma, Boulder, UK, first timers. Welcome to the first timers to the pre-sales collective webinar. Belgium, Minneapolis, love the global audience. Connor, how are Delia? Where are you guys dialing in from today? Well, I posted in the chat there quick. You <laughs> called me out already. You didn't know it. It's Oklahoma. Connor, I actually, I actually knew that, but I wanted you to feel like maybe there was a second person from Oklahoma here today. <laughs> I wish there was. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Oklahoma City. I'm in Tennessee. All right. And I'm, I'm in sunny London. Sunny London. Perfect. Looks like we, we got a lot of Texas representation today. Love it. A lot of Texas representation. We're going to get started in just a moment. moment. Denver. Again, welcome to the Pre-Sales Collective webinar. Uh, if you're joining us, let us know where you're dialing in from. We've got a pretty global audience today, which is wonderful. And let us know if this is your first time. Dominican Republic, Mexico, Chicago. Welcome to the first timers. I mean, I love the content in the webinars, but it's always just so fascinating to see where everybody is from. And you know, this is, this is one of my favorite parts about Pre-Sales Collective is just seeing the audience from all over the world. Uh, it's, it's really amazing. It's amazing to see. Welcome to the first timers. Looks like we still have some people coming in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Canada in the house as well. So welcome to the Pre-Sales Collective, how pre-sales sharpens the competitive edge. I'm James Kakis, co-founder of the Pre-Sales Collective, and I am joined by an amazing panel of pre-sales professionals and sales professionals today. And we'll give them a chance to introduce themselves in a moment. Uh, but I just want to thank everyone for being here today. Again, I mentioned, you know, one of my favorite things about Pre-Sales Collective and, and the webinars is, is just getting our profession together and getting people from all over the globe to talk about um, specific pre-sales topics. Competitive is one of my personal favorites. Um, so I'm really looking forward to today's webinar. And how you can get the best and the most out of today's webinar is ask questions in the Q&A. So we have some questions um, already planned for the panelists, but we're gonna take audience questions as well. And I always like to be active in the chat. I, sometimes I like to respond as well, but be active in the chat, ask questions in the Q&A. And before we get started, I would love to understand which option best describes your role. It allows us to understand who our audience is today. SC, SC, leaders, if you're interested in pre-sales, we have some sales leadership, some account executives, and some other today. Perfect. I'm going to leave that pull up for just a moment, and let's introduce our panel. Now, as I mentioned, we have a great panel today, and so I'll ask them to introduce themselves, and maybe they can get, they already gave their location, but uh, type, name, title, and maybe your favorite thing about pre-sales. Delia, let's start with you. Hi, everybody. Delia Parman here. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm in Tennessee. I lead um, the US mid-market and inside sales teams for my company, Medidata. And I've been in the pre-sales space for almost 20 years now. Very happy to be involved in it. One of my favorite things about pre-sales is the idea that it is now a true profession with a career path. In the old days, it used to be that you went into pre-sales just so that eventually you could become a salesperson. It's not like that anymore. And that's one of the things that I love about this particular profession is that it has become something that people can really build a career around and um, be impactful in the sales process. 
Oh, thanks, Julia. I, I love that, right? Because pre-sales is, is now a destination rule. We will be sure that pre-sales is a destination rule. So that's wonderful. Connor? Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks everybody for attending. Hello, I'm Connor Martin and I'm in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Um, and I am the, re I say the, uh, because we only have one. So I'm the regional vice president of sales at RFPIO and uh, have the privilege of uh, forming the strategy with the pre-sales part of the house at RFPIO. And I think, you know, like Delio was saying, um, there's not just the jump now where pre-sales is a legitimate profession with a, a career progression, but I think it's probably back and forth between the individual contributor role and the pre-sales role or the AE, senior AE, whatever that title is, where you might want to go from sales over to pre-sales and you might actually use that sales role to figure out which path is the best. And in a lot of ways, I think they're, uh, we're leveling the playing field in terms of the value that they provide, which is really exciting um, to know that there's this really rich skill set that you can have, not just on the sales side, but also now on the pre-sales side as well. So excited to talk about that and how that relates to competition. Also one of my favorite topics too, James, um, always will, always changing. One of the great things about being in sales is, mm -hmm. well, I think that you get to compete a lot. So mm -hmm. well, that's great. Thanks, Connor. And we're glad to have you. We're glad to have sales representation. You'll see what the pre-sales collective over the next couple of months. We're bringing in other roles uh, to these conversations because we think it will round out. So Connor, we're, we're glad to have you. Howard? Hi, everybody. My name is Howard Glynn. I'm Head of Solutions Architects at CloudReach here in London. Uh, CloudReach is a leading cloud computing consultancy. So we work with uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, Google Cloud, and Microsoft. Uh, I have, although I'm based in London, I have teams in North America and EMEA. And uh, you asked the question, like, what, what's our favorite thing about uh, uh, pre-sales? I think mine is, I love the creativeness of the problem solving process. You know, how do you glue lots of different things together to, to make something that's interesting for a customer? Absolutely agree, Howard. I, I love that as well. I think pre-sales professionals, I, I was one of them who didn't think I was creative. And then I realized that this role is pretty creative in general. So I, I love that you brought that up. Perfect. Well, we are, we are very excited to get started and we are going to just keep the uh, cameras on the panelists today. So I'll post the questions in the chat just in case you miss it. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, if you have questions, add them into the Q&A. And so where I want to start is like, let's level set. We have three essentially different roles here. We have sales leader, solutions consulting, solutions architecture. And I'd love to understand if each one of you can provide us a stance on how you handle competition in the sales cycle. So Howard, we're going to start with you. So uh, I think the, the simple answer to that is that we wouldn't generally dwell on the competition in the majority of the sales cycle. Um, I, you know, certainly what I've learned is that's that's reasonably accepted wisdom. Um, I don't. I think we've all observed situations where you hear a supplier badmouth the competition and it never sits well. I think the way the way we uh, uh, you know approach the problem is is to try our utmost to determine the, the the business outcomes that the customer is trying to achieve. And, and what are the sorts of capabilities that they uh, require to achieve that? And the way, the only way you can really do that is with strong discovery, you know, uncovering the customer needs and talk to them about them, uh, ask them questions. You know, again, not dwelling on the, the competition. And, it, and it's only really later, I think, once you've understood what the customer's after and, and, and played it back to them and agreed that and so forth, that, we're, that we really start to begin to think about the competition. And then it's simply a case of evidencing how we as an organization do it better without overtly, um, you know, sort of uh, bad mouthing the competition. So, so that would be our approach as uh, within CloudReach. Yeah, really good point, Howard. I like that you talk about not bad mouthing the competition. I think we'll get into a little bit of that today. Delia? So I'll, I'll start with the basics. And you and I were talking about this a few minutes ago, James, and that is learn who they are and what they do. Get as much information as you can about your, your rivals in your particular space and what their products or technologies or offerings are. And then my, our approach is just to be proactive in the sales cycle. Again, to Howard's point, not to badmouth or disparage who the competition is or what they do, but to proactively point out 
here are the ways that our technology and our company differentiate from the competition. So we're putting our positive messaging about how we are differentiated or our advantages up front before you have to be on the defensive. And so that's the way we typically approach it. Oh, well, that's great, Delia. And I'm going to ask you a follow-up question here in a moment. So off the cusp. Connor? Yeah. Um, well, it's from the not being in a, I've never been in a formal pre-sales role. So my perspective is a little bit different. Now, that being said, I want to uh, uh, vibe a little bit with the pre-sales side of the house. If anybody, if anybody from my team, I don't know if anyone from my team is on the webinar, but there was a longstanding uh joke when I was still selling individually and we were back in the office and I would be in a uh, conference room and with, you know, running a demo in the office and the door would be closed and they'd be like, oh, we need to get that conference room after that meeting's over. And they'd say, no, Connor will be in there for two hours. He's on a first call and uh, he does basically like two hour first demos because I've always been, you know, more like a pre-sales, uh, uh, I've had that pre-sales mindset, I guess, for for a long time, that's been really natural for me. So I think I have a good mix, in, in especially when talking about competition. So tying that back, um, I think with my product and solution mindset that, I, that I've that i had in my sales role, uh, the, the best product isn't guaranteed to win. The better salesperson or maybe combo of sales team with co-selling with pre-sales uh, uh, can overcome an inferior product, uh, I believe. And uh, this was illustrated for me about 10 years ago um, when the better salesperson may have looked different, but the principle holds, right? That um, you have to, you are selling against your competition. So I think it's more about from where I'm sitting in the sales side and not the pre-sales side. Um, I like to focus more on what you're doing and not what your competition is doing, what you can control, not uh, what your competitors may be uh, putting landmines or whatever out there for you. And uh, uh, then looking at it holistically thinking, let's not focus too much on the competition, uh, but let's think about the holistic deal and where can we create the best ROI and our activity? Because if we you know, spend an inordinate amount, amount of time trying to handle the competition, we might you know, spin our wheels for a deal that's well under our normal deal value just because it got really competitive. We were like, oh, we got to beat the competition. But ultimately at the end, is that, is that better for you know, your brand and your company and your, your, your number, your quota, the whole thing? So it, it's, it's more about the mindset of when we have competition, not necessarily how to handle them all the time. But yeah. Thanks for that, Connor. I can tell you, I speak on behalf of the pre-sales professionals that appreciate a sales leader with a good appreciation for pre-sales professionals. Good. Um, I, I want to actually ask Delia a question um, because I've even, one, the Q&A in the chat is already on fire. So thank you all for this already. Um, how do you learn more, right? We've kind of, we talked about this a little bit ahead of time, right? But how do you uh, encourage your teams to learn more, a little bit more about the competition? So I've been in different companies where um, sometimes you actually have a competitive Intel group or department. And they do a lot of um, research for you and are able to mine the sources that they have and provide overview information or latest uh, investor reports, those kinds of things. But honestly, I find, and this kind of speaks to what you were talking about a moment ago, Connor, I find talking to the customers and listening to their scenarios and what their situations are, if I'm doing good discovery, then I'm going to uncover problems. And oh, by the way, this is the technology that we've used and we've had issues with X, Y, Z. And so um, when, when we're in those situations, it's just a matter of having the conversation and understanding what the challenges are with whatever the systems are that the customer might be using. We collect that information, we share it with each other. So we have the official pool of research but then we also have information that comes directly from customers, which quite frankly, can, can very often be more powerful. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's great. And Brian O'Hara mentioned after deal reviews are the best way to get Intel. So appreciate that. I'm going to run a quick poll because I have what I hope is a little bit of a controversial poll here. Um, and as I'm going to get into the next question, so it is anonymous. And it's not very black and white, is it, James? <laughs> 
Nope. I only gave two options for a reason. It's anonymous as well. But when asked, do you believe you should acknowledge your true competition's name? So I'll give a quick example of this. Early in my career, we would face competition and we would name things. I, I worked at a company that did um, uh, sales content and, and enablement. And when they asked me what our competitors were, I wouldn't actually name our real competitors. I would name things like Dropbox or SharePoint or, or status quo, right? And, um, you know, that didn't always work down the road as, as buyers became a little bit more informed. And so we'll run this poll to absolute, to see how people are going to answer. But I, Delia, I'm curious, do you call out the names of competitors in your meetings? We don't really have to. Mm. So the industry that we are in um, is, is an industry where we know who the competitors are and they know who we are. And so it's not really, there are players that are um, the younger, newer companies that are trying to gain a larger market segment. And there are companies who are leaders and or trying to be the leaders in the industry. And so we don't have to name a name. We can talk about what our benefits are as opposed to possibly some of the functions or the features or the advantages of other companies. And we know as soon as a customer tells us about a situation, exactly who they are, um, who our competition might be in that scenario. So I, I will say I would not, do it anyway, <laughs> but in our situation, it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Connor, uh, yeah, Connor. Uh, I get, it's interesting. I guess it depends on your market. So, you know, I have a pretty different experience than Delia, at least uh, in the, my most more recent experience um, because she's, you know, she's saying that they probably know who it is. I'm also looking at the chat from Matt. He said, addressing fake competitors can introduce confusion into the deal. Also, if the buyer knows that's not a real competitor, it can undermine their trust. So to your point that you did, James, I've definitely done that before as a strategy. But I think what in the overarching uh, uh, strategy for addressing competition, I have two, I guess, main principles. One is kind of like Apple, you know, when you saw... Uh, I don't, I don't see commercials very often anymore, but when I used to see commercials, Apple was always focusing on Apple and they never called out the names of their competitors and like PC and the other ones, they would always have, they would compare themselves to Apple or Android would be comparing themselves to the iPhone, but Apple would never do it the other way around. And they were obviously, well, I, I mean, I think the, uh, their revenue speaks for it. They're like what a, a trillion over a trillion dollars of revenue now. Anyway, um, I've, in a, in a smaller way to have condensed that down and, and kind of approaching the competition that way. And like, let's always focus on ourselves. Let's not sell based on the competition, but that's one principle. The second one is kind of what you're talking about. Like, uh, do we confuse it? Do we try to maneuver around it? Do we try to misdirect and mystify the landscape or do we try to demystify the landscape, be more honest and try to build trust. And I believe if you weigh on that side of it, you're gonna build more trust with your customers and prospects, you're gonna win more than you lose because they're gonna trust you. Ultimately, whether it's the competition or it's you, they have to trust you to buy from you. Um, so you demystify, you say who they are, you approach it head on, not proactively, but when asked, you approach it head on and you say, yeah, this is who we compete against. Um, and let's talk about it kind of in a consultative way rather than a, well, I'm putting on a show and they're putting on a show and you can pick whoever's putting on the best show. Let's build the trust and have a consultative, you know, kind of conversation. And then hopefully they make the right decision. Yeah. Thanks, Ty, Connor. Appreciate that breakdown, Dillian Connor. 70% of folks said attack it head on. So that was a little bit more than I expected, which I'm happy to see. But again, a, a number of questions like Eric Gardner mentioned that if Gardner or Forrestor is being utilized to, for a short list and you uh, as an AE or SE team don't mention somebody, it could, you know, just, you know, add issues with that trust, right? And that component. So there's been a couple of questions. Uh, we're going to go off script because this is how I like to do these webinars is uh, a lot, a couple of questions on landmines. Right, so we talk about necessarily maybe acknowledging the competition. Uh, we're gonna get to a couple of things that some people are bringing up here in a moment, but I wanted to ask broadly, 
and one one of the three of you could raise your hand. Is anyone have a uh, perspective on putting landmines into your demo or to your talk track or to your positioning? So I, I can take that one, Sean. Um, I, I don't know whether I'd call them landmines, but we, we, but we would call them trap setting questions, which, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know front of the common terminology. I mean, I said earlier on that that when um, we want to do really strong discovery, and, and we've all agreed, I think, that, that uh, this need to understand the customer needs, what their outcomes are, what their capabilities are, um, it's really foundational, isn't it? And, and uh, only a strong discovery process can, can do that. But I suppose what, what we're then trying to do is uh, lay these trap setting questions out there, these landmines, in order to... Um, you know, inflate the value or, or, or map the value of what we're trying to uh, uh, propose to the customer against those outcomes. You know, so that, that would be, uh, I, I certainly it's, a, it's a, a valid part of the process. I mean, it's not done in a, in a way to, uh, you know, deliberately call out or again, bad mouth the competitor. It's simply, you know, okay, uh, Mrs. Customer, have you, do you recognize that this thing that we've got, you know, is really gonna, gonna satisfy your problem? Appreciate that, Howard. Connor, Delia, anything to add? I would add you, I mean, I think what Howard's saying, and this is how I would say it is know why you're doing it. So absolutely acceptable to set traps or have trap questions, have things that it's a leading question that you're trying to find out information, um, but know why you're doing it. It's just like running a, a sales demo as a salesperson or a pre-sales person. You've got to know why you're showing what you're showing. So same thing with those questions. Are you just asking the question because that's worked before and you think it might work in this case again? Or do you actually have a reason for why you're gonna lay that landmine and ask that question in this scenario? Um, so having a reason to, yes, do it, but have a reason. Don't just do it because, well, it's been done before, or I know that that's something that we theoretically uh, do better than the competition or whatever. There's gotta be a reason behind it. Yeah. For sure. I, I think from my personal experience, one thing that I, I have experienced um, on the opposite side is some of my competitors have reframed some things that they do very uniquely as like a, a massive sticking point in the process, right? So instead of like laying landmines, they've kind of reframed the objectives and it has boded well because then they would come to us to say, hey, so-and-so can do this. Can you do this? And we obviously couldn't, right? So it's now going back to tell them how that's not actually of value and impactful, but we've already been beat to the punch. So that's a personal story there. Um, Connor, you know, again, I'm going to continue to play on the pre-sales people and sales people uh, love, love, hate relationship. I think any, any good pre-sales professional loves when their sales rep can be dangerous. So as a pre-sales leader, to what level of depth do you require your salespeople to be knowledgeable about competition? Um, as an isolated uh, topic or area of knowledge in a sales rep's arsenal, however you want to put that, um, it's extremely important. And I would like them to be very knowledgeable about the competition. But again, in balance, mm -hmm. whether you're looking at an individual deal or what you're focusing on for your pipeline or uh, with your team, um, with your strategy for the quarter, it's got to it's got to be balanced out with the other things that you need to focus on. But extremely important. And one thing, I mean, the ABC of we've already touched on this, but the ABC of competition is always be collecting, like always collect competitive intel all the time. So to a certain extent, you have to be constantly thinking about it. If you're in your deal and you, you've been uh, given an, an answer to a, a strategic question and you have an inflection point where you know you're going to place this question in the discovery process or late stage and they give you an answer that is intel, right? You could, you could treat it as intel, whether they said the name of a competitor directly or not, or you can in, in, intuitively know that's what it's about. You always have to be collecting that information. And then ultimately it goes back to the thing I was saying earlier about let's have a, let's gain trust and be looked at more of a, you know, a consultant. And that's not in our titles at RFPIO. You know, it's not like our people are sales consultants. We're salespeople, we're closing deals. But the function is let's be looked at more as a consultant, gather that information and then build trust so we can provide it back. If you don't have that knowledge, you're gonna severely be lacking in the ability to build that trust. 
So I think it's extremely important for my salespeople to have that. And we have that as our culture, like always be collecting mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to competitive info uh, on, from our market, always be collecting that. And then it, it builds that trust with your prospects. No, that's great, Connor. I appreciate that. I will ask the audience in the chat to let me know some ways that they have made sure that their sales rep have a point of view. Are you kind of coaching them up? Are you providing them with them intel? I'm just curious to see what the audience has to say. So if you could just send that in the chat uh, while we move to the next question to be appreciated. So I'm going to switch gears to Howard and Delia. Um, you know, for pre as a pre-sales leader, you know, what level of expectation do you have from sales reps around competition and how do you excuse me how do you suggest your teams to manage reps who might not be meeting that expectation so howard let's start with you so i guess i look at this um there's a very symbiotic relationship obviously between um solutions architects or, or pre-sales engineers and, and the sellers and you know as sas we're expected to have that uh, deep product knowledge, deep technical knowledge, uh, you know, huge, uh, wide variety of, of different experiences. And on the, on the flip side, I, I expect our sales reps to have a, um, you know, properly qualified relationships and they've navigated the customer organization, you know, so, so there's a, there's definitely a, a balance there. Um, reps who don't meet that expectation, you know, it's a very fast way to alienate the people you, you really do depend upon, isn't it? Um, you know, it, I, I used to ask an interview, in fact, I probably still do ask an interview question. It's like, what's a good essay seller relationship? What's a bad essay seller relationship? And invariably, the answer for the bad relationship always tends to dwell on uh, they try and delegate too much to me or they just don't take an interest in something. And so that, that um, you know, that's them not meeting expectations, shall we say. And I, I encourage my essay team to... Um, you know, simply say no in certain circumstances. You know, you're not there. An essay isn't there as a uh, as an admin for for a sales rep. Um, I want them to push back, but it, but it requires a clear process and accountability, I suppose, that to, to define that relationship. But I would also say that more constructively, if we're seeing that individual sales, sellers are, are not meeting expectation, we we've uh, we often run initiatives where we try and teach the sellers um you know about the technology but it, it's it's a nice way of doing it because uh not only does it help them understand it better but it also serves to allow the the sa team to to practice and and refine their, their communication and language which is often uh, necessary to non-technical audiences yeah oh that's great howard and i think a lot of people in the chat have made mentions of you know, coaching those people up and having readbacks and making a habit of it after, after calls of being able to talk about these things to kind of hold that accountability. Accountability, Delia. Well, so you'd ask initially what the expectation should be, and I think anyone who's involved in promoting or selling the solution or the technology needs to understand the landscape. So, mm -hmm. by all means, salespeople, marketing people, product people pre-sales people should all understand the landscape that they're working in, their space and who the competition or rivals might be and what they are about. Um, there's no excuse for not knowing that given the access we have to data and information today. So mm -hmm. that should be the expectation. Having said that, um, in our particular situation, our solution consultants typically are aligned with accounts and reps and work with them um, early on in the sales cycle, they collaborate on what is our messaging need to be, who are we talking to. And so if it's a situation where the sales rep is just not knowledgeable because they haven't had an opportunity to get that exposure, then a solution consultant should be able to, you know, step up, take that kind of uh, situation and take the lead in whatever they need to do as far as the messaging is concerned. And by doing that, then the sales rep is going to understand, okay, this is something that I probably need to get a little better handle on for working with our customers moving forward. So we're trying to keep it collaborative. We step up when we need to, but the expectation in our organization is that everybody should be enabled and also understand that space. Love that, Delia. I mean, you made a, a lot of mentions there. Um, I actually want to go to Connor to respond. Yeah. So wondering from the pre-sales side, and there's some chat about this, it, I think in RFPI, we might be a little bit, un, well, maybe we're not unique in this, I don't know, but as, as the sales organization as a whole grows and you 
might grow pre-sales and sales in tandem uh, or in parallel. You might grow one faster than the other. Uh, I guess it depends on the approach of the leadership, but who should really own that competitive intel? I think the sales reps should own it, but it sounds like from the pre-sales side, maybe you're leaning more on naturally the pre-sales people should, would have more uh, uh, competitive intel and would be able to train the sales reps up more. But in my experience, I almost see it in the opposite way. Delia. Yeah, I, I, I was just gonna say, I think I agree with you, Conrad. The, the, uh, the, the, I see in the sales intel, you know, the, the, the different maneuvering of, of competitors within the landscape is, is probably with the, the sales rep. I mean, the, the intel on the different uh, capabilities and, and I suppose the product features and attributes uh, probably lies with the technical teams. Yeah, Delia, do you want to add on there? Yeah, I don't know that I, I don't know that I um, have, I don't know who should take the lead or who should know the most. I'm not sure what I feel about that. But what I will say is from a solution consulting or solution engineer perspective, um, typically we have a broader access to broader scope of information than an account executive might who's working with their customers. And so perhaps because of that, we have access to more information broadly as far as the landscape and the competition and our rivals are concerned. But I don't know, Connor, whether, uh, I think that's a chicken and egg question. Maybe who really needs to take the lead on knowing the most or providing that information. I feel like it's a team sport. Yeah, always be collecting. Uh, I, I want to ask the audience. I feel like this is like a game show right now. So ask the <laughs> audience, who, who should own the A, E, or S, C? Who should own the, the Intel? Now, I, I maybe have a little bit more of a, a concrete perspective. I just, when I think about like how account executives are compensated and a lot of their skill sets, I, I hate to say that I don't have as much trust that the information coming out of the comp, uh, competitive Intel is maybe as thorough as deep as some of the SEs would potentially go. And to Delio's point, like depending on the size of the org and the account list, right? If you're an account executive that covers the entire world and you're covering different types of companies, um, that gives you a broader depth and, and, and sense. But a lot of times when SEs are one to, one to two, one to five, one to 15, they're going through a, an, uh, an array of customers, right? So they have a little bit broader perspective but I do agree with you, Connor, that like the, the sales executive needs to have a good enough understanding to sometimes get that information and pass it to the SE team or pass it to the product marketing team if that's where competitive Intel lives, um, wherever it might be. So I'm wondering if, if Howard or um, yeah, Howard or Delia have a, a different stance here. I Well, I guess I would say um, from your perspective about the, the sales of the account executive uh, and not being sure that they have this, I mean, they, their goal is to sell. And so they may have a good understanding or not about who the competition is. And I, as I said before, I'm not sure that there's ownership needed. I think everyone <laughs> should be um, attuned to what the competition is doing and who they are and share that information with each other. Um, so that when you're in a sales cycle or you have an opportunity, then you're going to be able to make the most effective decisions and strategy and messaging. Um, I, I don't feel strongly about who takes the lead as far as the knowledge is concerned. Yeah, James, I think, I think you were uh, trying to put it delicately that, hey, I don't trust what comes out of this salesperson's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it, Connor. I didn't say it because some salespeople... I might trust more on competition than others. It just depends. But it's funny, I'll say it, uh, in the chat that some people are saying, doesn't product own the competitive Intel? I think this is what's so fascinating, right? Like is who, who actually owns it? Um, next next month's or next week's webinars, who owns the demo? Maybe we should add who owns the competitive Intel. Could have probably talked for an hour on that, but good perspectives here. And, and to the points, again, I think it's very clear. There, there has to be trust. And I think, that your teams, regardless of their position, if they're customer facing and, and, and literally in a sales cycle, they need to have a level of knowledge and understanding to be dangerous in that conversation and to build the trust and, and have that knowledge, right? Because I always felt like one of the worst things 
that I, I felt like when a partnership with an account executive is when they would come into the room and say, well, this is my smart person. They're going to talk for the next two hours. Like you just could totally discredited yourself. Right. And so how do you make sure that you have Connor, you're laughing. You might've heard that before. So I just, it's just, I just am imagined that would, I'm, I can confident. Well, I can't say <laughs> certainty, but I'm, that's not happening on my team. Good. But that's good, but, that but it happens. Right. And you, you, as a sales professional, SEAE, whatever your role might be, need to be able to have a good understanding to build that trust and continuity. And, you know, people can do their homework. As Delia said, there's enough information out there that people can do their homework. And so, all right, that was a great debate. Thank you all for that. Uh, we're going to continue moving on because we got some good questions planned. So Howard, I have a scenario question for you. And this has come up in the Q&A a, a mm -hmm. couple of times now is that your product has a strong value prop, but doesn't have all the bells and whistles like other in the space. Maybe it's an inferior product. How do you still make sure that you're instilling confidence uh, in your teams that they can solve customer challenges? Look, I, th I think this comes, we, we touched on it earlier when we were talking about landmines and, and trap setting questions. I, I actually genuinely don't think this is about the product. It's about the training of the individuals and the process by which they can uh, discover and talk to the customer and, uh, and articulate the capabilities back to the, uh, the, the requirements that the customer has. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's matching. This, this trap setting question is about making the customer uh, realize the merits of, of your particular product. And, you know, we, many, many people here will have, will have been familiar with things like emotional intelligence and being emotionally EQ, EQ scores, being mindful of what the customer needs, actively listening and so forth. But it's that training that, that will give the that will give your staff, the, the pre-sales engineers, the confidence, the supreme confidence to, to in, in what they have. Right. Because at the end of the day, all of those bells and whistles become largely irrelevant if they're not mapped to a particular need. So in a sense, you can sweep them off to the side. And, and that would definitely be uh, uh, our approach. And that's how I would instill confidence, by like getting them to focus on the, uh, uh, the business outcomes and the required capabilities and how the product or the thing that you're trying to propose matches them. Very well said, Howard, because a couple of the questions talked about things being flashy from the demo perspective. I'm sure we've all seen companies who have very flashy demos, but when it's actually time to put pen to paper, the product doesn't necessarily do what you want it to. And we'll talk about POCs and POVs here in a moment, uh, but I, I appreciate that perspective, Howard. Um, I'd like us all to get vulnerable for a minute, right? Let's, <laughs> let's, let's maybe share a little story um, so maybe each of you could tell me a situation where, where a competitive situation went bad, right? Tell us what happened and what you learned from that situation. So Howard, let's start with you. Yeah. I mean, we, we've all got our war stories, right? Um, in this regard, and I've certainly, uh, observed it a few things. Uh, we, we talk about red flags. And, it, and it's easy with the benefit of hindsight to, to spot those red flags uh, uh, higher up uh, higher up the process, if, if you like. Um, it, it typically, uh, well, I mean, there was one particular example. I remember a large customer where uh, due to a change in circumstances, you know, we lost access to our champions and our, um, you know, those kinds of individuals. And, and I suppose we were caught a bit flat footed. And what happened is, was that, larger firms with uh, arguably greater access to decision makers and, and higher ups and so on were able to strategically move in and then you know by a by a sort of a, a process of attrition um removed us by by shaping the competitive requirements to their own ends i mean i'm sure we've all been in situations where you you read a, an rfp or a, or a competitive bid and it's like i know who's written this um, you know, and that, and that happens. And so I think the, the one of the ways we try and mitigate that now is to watch for those red flags earlier. And we actually developed a, uh, a I mean, it's a fairly modest tool that, that effectively asks us to be reflective and answer truthfully a, a, a bunch of questions. It is literally 20 questions, as, as the saying goes, um, that creates a sort of predictor. And it's asking ourselves, you know, do we know the procurement process really, truly? You know, do we know who the competitors are? And and, you know, even red flags are things like, is the customer willing to talk to us? And, you know, you see these blind uh, 
uh, exercises that, that get thrown at you. And, and, and very often it's uh, just, to, just to finish up, you know, you observe these situations where the customer has clearly got an incumbent, but it's a, it becomes a sham process because of the fact that they have to they have to be seen to be going through competitive tendering and competitive procurement. And there are lots of you know ways you can spot red flags, although it's easy, clearly it's easier afterwards than it is beforehand. But we look out for those because yeah, we've been burned with them and we try to learn from the experience. Yeah. Thanks, Howard. A couple people have asked questions about column fodder and making sure you're actually part of real process. Yes. Uh, Delia. So I'm going to take this in a little bit different direction and not talk about a specific scenario, although in my history, I've had plenty of them. But um, what I thought about when we were talking about this is um, how a company approaches their stance and their um, reaction or response to competition. So in a former life, I worked for a company that at the time was the leader in this particular market and many others. And um, they did not give true credence to the rivals and the competition, perhaps smaller companies or companies that were um, startups or not quite as tenured in the space and basically said, we don't have anything to worry about you know, we're the leader, we're always going to be the leader. And so they had blinders on mm -hmm. and didn't pay attention to what was really happening and ended up losing a significant part of that market share to some of those smaller companies. I bet we all can think of exactly in our particular technology space or, or uh, offering exactly that kind of scenario. I think we need to be mindful of that as, as organizations. Uh, are we the leader? And if we're the leader, it's going to be harder to stay the leader yep. than it is to um, be a small up and coming company who knows where our, um, our short shortcomings might be. We need to take that seriously. And we need to make sure that we are thinking about uh, the fact that the landscape can change in a, in a minute. And so you can't get too arrogant yeah. or overly confident in what your particular position might be, because there's always going to be somebody that may come up with something better. Very, very well said. There, that is very well said, Dealer. I appreciate you sharing that. Connor? Yeah, that is a great perspective. Um, I mean, we were RFPIO, we were the uh, latest entrant to the market of our primary competitors. Uh, so yeah. immediately we were punching up. And we knew exact, I mean, we, we figured out pretty quick exactly where to target, you know, and uh, we, so then getting to the other side of being a little bigger and experiencing some others doing what we did to, in the past, it, it's easy to rest on your laurels or get arrogant or just complacent. Maybe you're not arrogant, but you're complacent. It's as the sports analogy is like, you know, in the football, in football, you're like, okay, we're starting the second half and uh, the score is zero, zero. But if we're behind by 21, we just need to win 21 to zero in the second half. So every deal you have, it's zero, zero. You've never lost your competition before. You've also never beat your competition before, but you have a lot of film on them. You have a lot of intel on them and you can handle it that way. Um, but anyway, so I really like that point that what you were saying, Delia, but the one, I, I will share a specific uh, situation I've never lost a competition. So it's, this is somebody else's story, not mine. <laughs> um, but, uh, we, we, uh, it was an a, a enterprise opportunity. Um, we knew uh, who was competing in this opportunity. And I think we were positioned as, you know, we kind of knew we were positioned as probably the leader for this particular customer. They would see us as the leader. Um, we had the, the thought that it was ours to lose, right? I think we've all been there. This is your, you know, yours to lose, whether they told you that or you just thought that that was probably your stance. And we lost it um, to get to the punch. <laughs> so we did lose it because uh, they wanted it more than us. And uh, we knew it was ours to lose. And we thought, well, we're not going to lose it because it's ours. So it's ours. We didn't think about the to lose part. Um, so they brought in, they really showed a, a, a lot more executive presence and team. They showed a different support front. Um, 
the the prospect and and then also they the the leads on the prospect side were focused on a specific area of the business um, that circumstantially wasn't it wasn't the primary area that we would be serving, but they got brought in as a leader to help this evaluation. And our competition focused on what their primary role was in the company and, and morphed that into the, the sales process, even though their primary role in the company didn't relate to what we were selling. So our competition just outmaneuvered us. They presented a different front than us. And in the end, uh, when we got to get, when we got some feedback, they said, you know, we, your product's better. They admitted it. They said, your product's better. Um, but, it was hard to choose. And because of the way that they presented their overall offering in their company, we went that direction. And that one, you know, we certainly learned from that one and have taken some action from that one. Um, Cause it, you can learn from it, but if you don't take some action, just like Howard was saying, you know, they created the 20 question sheet or whatever it is, you've got to, you've got to have something that you're doing because of that. So anyway. Yeah. I appreciate that Connor. I mean, that's, that's right. You learn, but you need to put into action. I appreciate the three of you sharing that. Uh, story, those stories for sure. I think there's a lot of good impact there. Um, I'm because we're about 15 minutes left. I'm going to merge in a couple of questions that we got from Q and A and chat. And H Howard, I'm going to start with you on this one. I mentioned POC earlier, so mm -hmm. a little bit of a, how would you handle this type of scenario? Question: Competitors are always suggesting a POC or a POV because their product's a little bit easier to stand up. It's much harder for your organization to do that. And your team is pushing back against the request of standing up a, a POC. How would you handle that? Yeah, look, I, I can understand what, what, um, why competitors and even ourselves would push for that because invariably when you do, customers lean in, you know, and, and, it, and it's, uh, it's great to be able to push and point and, uh, uh, and look at things and, and uh, compare and contrast. Look, I, I think you have to frame this kind of request as a, uh, as a catalyst to, to create some sort of repeatable demo. Um, yeah, it might be a bit of short-term pain, some uh, light nights and so on, but, but there's a long-term gain. Um, I'm also minded to say that, that if it is, I'm asking a question that says, if it is hard to stand up a demo, why? Um, you know, what, what does that say to the customer or the competitor about your product, but maybe it's too complex. Uh, and certainly word needs to get back to the, uh, uh, I suppose the product teams to, uh, to, to understand that. I, but, uh, but again, to put a more positive spin on it, um, if, if that situation arises, I, I've used that as a great learning opportunity for my team and, and team members. Um, I have successfully used new starters and, and graduates, um, you know, to build that demo and it, and it gives them ownership of something, it helps them learn and, you know, they can present it back within internal teams as well. And who's to say they can't, you know, drive the demo at, uh, at customer situations as well to get exposure and help their learning. So, yeah, it's it's tough, right? I mean, uh, it, um, I've, I've seen, you know, great examples of where it has worked and, and it, it usually has very positive outcomes. So you've got to embrace it and, and deal with it and, and make sure that you curate the content for the next time. Yeah. Thanks, Howard. Connor? I've uh, wavered a lot, not wavered, ebbed and flowed a lot of my response to this. So if you asked me this once a quarter, I might give you a different answer <laughs> over the past five years or so, um, or even the past 10 years, probably. Uh, <clears throat> currently, I would say same question that Howard had. Well, why are you asked? Why are you saying that this is hard? <laughs> this is part of what we have to do. You know, we got to push that back on our team a little bit too, right? And say, well, what is our, what, why is it hard? If you're saying it's hard, why is it hard? This is a requirement. You know, we want to be strategic about it. We're not just always going to say yes. You know, th that even goes to a strategy of are you posting that you have a tr get a trial account on your website or something? Like, where does what's the company strategy there? Um, but if you know you're in the POC or POV game, then you've got to be ready for it. And you've got to be able to do it. And when the requests come, you've got to have a process. However, it can be easier or more difficult for your company or a different company to stand up the POC. But what is the prospect seeing? I think that's what we have to narrow in on is it's not about us internally. We've accepted that we have to be in POCs or POVs and we have dollars associated to that. We have metrics associated to that. So we're making the decision that we're going to participate in the game of trials, POCs, POVs. Okay, we're in. All right, we're doing that. It's worth it for us as a company to do that. So what is it like for the prospect and what is their experience? Are you doing, you know, 40 hours of work to get that stood up? 
and make it look really nice and operational per their requirements. And then they get in for the first time and they have no idea what you did, but they know it looks amazing, right? So ultimately, I mean, you can't, you got to kind of take it and say, what are the challenges we have with this and how do we make the prospect have the best experience possible? Um, and you have to believe that you're in on that game, you know, that mm -hmm. we're doing POCs, we're doing POVs. They're valuable for us. They're valuable for the customer. And uh, so there's a certain level of effort that goes in. And I guess defining it and making sure that that's, um, that, that's clearly defined. But the last point would be uh, on competitors always suggest a POC or POV is really interesting uh, because we've even just seen that ebb and flow in of itself. Like we'll have a season where every customer is asking for a trial. You do a first call and they're like, all right, can we play with it? And then you have a season where you can get a, get away with, you know, not doing it and uh, you're just closing deals on demos or whatever it might be. So it's so interesting how that changes in, in a, a bigger question maybe that I'm not going to try to answer would be how do you as a sales organization with pre-sales and sales, how do you want to approach your market with suggesting that your prospects do POCs or POVs? Is that an asset for you or is it not? I'd love to talk about that. I don't think we have time, but. Um, that's a whole other thing on a different topic. Right? I could talk for the whole podcast on this topic. This is actually one of my favorites. So I, I appreciate everything you guys added there. And Connor, you're, you're definitely right on that last bit uh, about making sure the organization's prepared. Delia, you're going to take us home. We're going to have one final question for you. Um, what advice do you have for pre-sales professionals that are struggling in head-to-head -head competitive situations? Well, the first thing that I'm going to say is you need to have confidence in your company's offering and what it is that you are trying to sell to your customer. You have to feel like it's really going to benefit the customer because if you are able to present your um, solution in a way that you really believe is going to help them, then that diffuses a whole lot of the FUD that the competition might be trying to send your way. So you have to, if you don't feel confident in your company's technology, then there are bigger questions that you need to ask yourself about the role that you're playing. But I think that's the first thing. And then develop a set of what you know are differentiators or based upon what you know the typical customer in your industry needs here are the ways that our platform can help take care of that. We know that we can, we understand your business. And so we're gonna be able to help you with that. And then the, the other thing kind of goes back to, you've got to have a different strategy depending upon where you are in that space. And I talked earlier about the big companies, the market leader and the smaller companies are trying to really gain more of that, that part of the segment. Where do you fit there? Because that's also going to uh, determine how far am I going to go with my message? What is it I really believe in? What are the things that I want to be able to do to overtake my competition in this marketplace? It's just a matter of finding what those messages are and feeling confident about delivering them. Well said. Way to take us home, Delia. Much appreciated. Uh, Connor, Howard, Delia, you guys have been fantastic. We really appreciate you being on today's webinar. I had a lot of fun. Uh, Delia and I were messaging even during that. We need to have a part two. I feel like there could be a part three and a part four to this conversation. Uh, so thank you both. Uh, thank all three of you so much for being here today. Uh, for those who are still on, I really appreciate it. Please let us know how we did today. And we want to know if we're going to see you next week. We're going to be doing, um, what does it mean to own your demo? Uh, before we wrap up, just a couple quick announcements. I want to thank RFPIO and thank Connor for being here. Uh, RFPIO uh, is a sponsor of today's webinar. Uh, it's been great getting to know them and their team. And actually on the pre-sales podcast, I had their CEO and founder, Ganesh Shankar, uh, on, on yesterday. And we had an amazing conversation. So definitely listen to that and check that out. Um, I've been very impressed by RFPIO and their product in terms of helping with RFPs. I mean, I think we all know that uh, they can be a, a bit of a time suck generally. And so having some technology that helps us out is, is definitely incredible. And even Connor mentioned the Rise Up conference. I, I joined that earlier this year. I've been just super impressed by them and we've enjoyed getting to know them. 
um, as an organization and getting to know them as a product. Um, so for all those in attendance, if you are looking to join more pre-sales collective events, uh, we are really trying to standardize everything on Luma. So lu.ma slash PSC will have all of our events. This includes our WISE programming, our book club programming, as well as our webinars, even Leadership Next, our events were there, and Slack. We're going to cross 5,000 members in Slack today. So um, this is pretty incredible, uh, super active environment. We can continue the conversation on competitive and there are a number of different channels, geos, local groups, um, really incredible conversations happening in the Slack. So if you're not in the Slack, uh, we hope to see you there, presalescollective.com slash Slack. And otherwise, uh, one last thing is that we did roll out some new enablement on Monday. So we have enablement on value selling, uh, stakeholder management, and sales partnerships. Uh, definitely encourage you to check those out, presalescollective.com slash education. Uh, the Leadership Next event videos are on our YouTube, and this will be on YouTube uh, in about an hour from now. So thank you again for attending. Delia, Howard, and Connor, again, thanks for your time, and we'll see everybody next week. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Yeah.